want to check if any of the board members are back. Hi there, this is President Rubina Amen, and I will have um, Brooke do uh, a roll call for us. Alicia Urban Amen. Here. Katarina Ellaby. Present. Jesus Dominguez. Present. Daniel Drummer. Present. Tony McMillian. Present. All members are present and the board has a quorum. Thank you, Brooke. Okay, we're gonna move right into uh, agenda item number 11, the legislation report with Brooke. Okay, so due to the ongoing pandemic, leadership in the Senate and Assembly have requested that members voluntarily reduce their legislative package to allow only the most critical and pressing bills to move forward. A significant number of bills have been dropped by members and many policy committees are taking a proactive role in limiting what is being set for hearing. The assembly and Senate legislative calendars have also been modified, resulting in temporarily different calendar deadlines in each house. Um, the assembly had its house of origin deadline last Friday and has adjourned for summer recess until Monday, July 13th. The Senate remains in session and is scheduled to adjourn for summer recess on July 2nd. So beginning July 13th, the assembly and the Senate calendar deadlines will become harmonized for the remainder of the 2020 legislative session. So some upcoming legislative calendar highlights are as follows. Uh, June 26th is the last day for the Senate to pass bills introduced in that house. July 13th, both the Senate and assembly will reconvene from summer recess. August 21st is the last day to amend bills on the floor. And August 31st is the last day for each house to pass bills and recess will begin upon adjournment. Mm -hmm. so the last day for the governor to act on past legislation will be September 30th. I'll go ahead and direct members to page 50, which is where the legislative summary begins. And I'll go ahead and go through each bill and update you on the status as they, the status has changed over the last few days. There's been a lot of movement on some of the bills. So AB 613, regulatory fees, this is a two-year bill, which is located currently in the Senate BMP. This bill would authorize programs within BCA to increase their fees every four years in an amount not to exceed the increase in the consumer price index in the last four years. So any fees um, increased pursuant to this bill would be exempt from the Administrative Procedure Act. The next bill is AB 888, Opioid Prescriptions, Non-Pharmacological Treatments for Pain. This is also a two-year bill and it's located in the Senate BMP. This bill would expand existing requirements for prescribers when discussing specific risks associated with opioids when dispensing a patient's first prescription for a controlled substance containing an opioid. This bill would also require a prescriber to obtain informed written consent from a patient a minor patient's parent or guardian, or another authorized adult as specified. Additionally, this bill would require prescribers to discuss the availability of specifically identified non-pharmacological treatments for pain, which are included, but of course not limited to acupuncture, chiropractic care, physical therapy, occupational therapy, and licensing uh, mental health provider services. And they would also be able to offer a referral for those services. The next bill is AB 1263, Contracts Consumer Services, uh, Consumer Complaints, and this bill was just referred to the Senate BMP Committee. This bill would prohibit a DCA licensee from limiting a consumer's right to file a complaint with the licensing board or participate in an investigation into the licensee by the licensing board. So a violation would constitute as unprofessional conduct, which would be subject to discipline by the licensing board. This is Daniel. Do we know, I mean, I'm assuming there, this is happening because legislation is being proposed. Um, do we know of any examples? Um, the, the purpose of this bill, the target of this bill is those boards that have what they call arbitration units. 
Um, and in those professions where there's an arbitration unit in the regulatory structure, some um, have offered contracts that essentially say you have to have tried to enter into arbitration before you can finally submit a complaint for discipline. Um, but I think on a grander scale, um, the legislature is just trying to kind of attack the idea um, that a consumer can always file a complaint against any regulated license, regardless of whether or not there's an arbitration or not. And any trying to block that would be an act of unprofessional conduct. And do you know, do you have examples of the um, boards that have this arbitration model? Um, the, the most notable would be the Bureau of Automotive Repair and the Contractor State Licensing Board. Thank you. So AB 1616, DCA board expunge, expunge convictions was just referred to the Senate BMP committee. This bill would require programs under DCA that post information on its website about a revoked license due to a criminal conviction to update or remove information about the revoked license within six months of the board receiving an expungement order related to the conviction. The person seeking the change would um, be mandated to pay a fee to the board, which is determined by DCA, which would be designed to cover the administ administrative costs of these requirements, as outlined in the bill. The next bill is AB 1665, Athletic Trainers, which is currently in the Senate pending referral to a policy committee. This bill would create the California Board of Athletic Training within the DCA. It would also enact the Athletic Training Practice Act. It would prohibit a person from practicing as an athletic trainer without being licensed by the, by the board, define the practice, specific, specify licensure requirements, and require an athletic trainer to practice in collaboration with a physician. This is Daniel. Um, two years ago, an almost identical bill was uh, was proposed, and this board took a, a position of oppose unless amended. Um, and I would like to um, suggest that we pursue a similar action. Um, the last two years ago, uh, we um, charged the we charged staff to uh, produce a letter um, that would be submitted. Um, some of the rationale, uh, or the rationale pretty much still stays the same. Um, this, the language of the bill allows athletic trainers to essentially treat anybody that moves, anybody that's injured in movement and isn't, is not specifically related to, ath to athletes and athletic uh, events, which my understanding is where their, their specialization really really stands. Um, and this bill also allows them to work in collaboration with the physician um, or surgeon, uh, but not necessarily under the supervision of a physician and surgeon, um, which in my mind, again, puts members of the public at risk for potential for um, being cared for without by somebody who doesn't have the appropriate training. Any other board comments on um, a possible support of a letter of opposition? I had difficult, this is Daniel, I had difficulty finding um, the copy of the letter just in my dig of uh, the old minutes and Brooke was able to um, to locate it for me and she shared it with me. Um, and at that time it was, the bill had pre 
proceeded to being ready to be presented to the governor, um, who had also vetoed similar version of the bill at least once before. Um, and then um, this bill, I believe, was um, was vetoed by Governor Brown as well. Um, in the last legislative session, we dealt with this particular type of bill. Um, yeah, Dr. Jumbo, you're correct. It had been vetoed by Governor Brown twice before, but in the last session, it got to the Appropriations Committee, um, sat in suspense, and ultimately died. And we did issue a letter to the Business and Professions Committee about the board's opposition, but we never really had the opportunity to provide that letter to the governor because the bill did not move forward as such. And um, Brooke, um, can you, I, I believe this was initiated last year in 2019 for this, the current two year session, 2019, 2020, correct? So this is a first year bill, it's in its first part of the session for this particular bill. But in 2018, we did address in the previous legislative session, AD 3110. Michael, can I just to answer the other portion, portion of your question, Dr. Drummer? So this is the second year of the biennium. So this bill, if it doesn't make it this year, would have to be reintroduced. Mm -hmm. Correct. And I'm actually looking at the information from Ledge Info, and it indicates that the bill was introduced by Assemblymember Cha, CHAU, on February 22nd, 2019. Um, and then for this, for the second half of it, for this session, it's now been picked up by Assemblymember Bonta and, and then reintroduced. Uh, um, my missing misreading. Uh, Dr. Drummer, this is Michael again. The AB 1665 in 2019 related to another topic, Parents Accountability and Child Protection Act, and that bill was amended to completely remove those contents and put in this bill. Okay, so thank you for that. Here. Not as a not as an athletic trainer bill, but it was a spot bill that then was gutted and now amended to include to, to be it to address athletic trainers. Correct. It was a bill on a different subject. Got it. Um, so it's been now reintroduced in the second half of this session. Correct. Correct. Okay. So. Um, just to move things along a little bit, if I might ask each board member um, if they have any comment um, one by one. Katerina, any feelings or thoughts about this in um, an opposition letter? I don't feel strongly enough to support an opposition letter. I'm comfortable just keeping a watch on it, uh, but I'm open to hearing. I'm interested in hearing what the other members have to say. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Dominguez? Thank you, Madam President. I, you know what? I, I know physical therapy education fairly well. I do not know athletic training education. Um, but, you know, I don't want to assume anything, but I think Dr. Drummer's comments about the question of whether or not, uh, you know, academically they're prepared to sort of uh, treat a broader range of patients and or clients and what they might be trained for. It's a little concerning to me, sort of in between Katarina's uh, watch and Dr. Drummer's oppose, maybe leaning a little more towards oppose since the majority of the board's composition, I think was the same last year. We sort of adopted a, an oppose and less amended position. So just some initial thoughts on my part. I just, I find the language I don't really know what collaboration means. I, I, you know, I don't want to assume that it's a softer word than, than um, Dr. Drummer's supervision. 
but if it is, I, I'd have some some concerns about safety. Thank you, and Ms. McMillian. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say, since I'm not a practitioner in either field, um, I'm finding myself leaning more towards where Dr. Drummer is coming from. Too. I just wanted to state that for the record. Thank you. And I, I think I'm with Dr. Drummer and also with Dr. Dominguez as well. Um, and, you know, thinking of safety, um, that's just something I'm not sure I have enough uh, information here with this bill to ensure that there would be public safety. Um, so I would support a letter of opposition. Um, Mr. Kaiser, do you have anything you want to add? Um, I think it's very consistent with positions that you've held in the past as a board. Um, staff and I can look at the previous opposition letter and compare it to the um, AB 3110 language. Um, propose a, a oppose or oppose a less amended, whatever the board would like. Um, there are a few other kind of inconsistencies that from the last um, viewing of this bill to today that don't look like they're much of an issue anymore. Uh, if I remember correctly, I think the board had an issue with the way that um, previous bills proposed funding the newly um, structured board. Um, and I don't see that language in the AB 3110 language. Um, but for those purposes, um, should you direct staff, we can formulate a letter and um, provide that letter to the board president for approval um, and upon her signature distributed to the parties involved. This is Daniel. Um, just to further clarify the funding of the board, um, it, in my read of of the current bill language, it looks very similar, I believe, um, with taking loans from the athletic training uh, certification body and others to be able to support the startup and then paying and then paying back those loan paying back those loans once application fees, et cetera, accumulate. I believe that's very similar language to what was there before. Very similar. I think just maybe sequentially a little bit different where I think the focus in the last language was that that's how they were going to structure it. Here, I think they're looking for almost a donation program, if you will, and if that donation from private funds fails, that they would uh, shift to general fund loan or even special fund loan. And special fund loan is that word that you want to keep an eye out for because special fund loan would indicate any of the other boards or bureaus within the Department of Consumer Affairs um, who are amiable to this idea could, if they could afford it, provide a loan to that, um, to that cause. Thank you for that clarification. So if I may, Madam President, propose a motion. Absolutely. Let me find the language. Um, uh, move to authorize the executive officer and staff to develop a letter of opposition unless amended for AB 1665. This is Jesus. I can second that. So is this a question of clarification from the administrator's perspective? When you say uh, oppose or less amended, do you have ideas of what those amendments would look like? Um, one would be to remove the term athletic or term athlete patient. So, and because uh, I believe current wording includes uh, that they are that they would be authorized to treat athletes and athlete patient. And the athlete patient is then described as somebody who has participated in um, an athletic activity um, or pretty much any other movement type of e injury. Um, 
So uh, somebody walking uh, in a parking lot to an athletic event would then be able to be treated by an athletic trainer. So it's similar to um, the opposition post in the past. Here it's a little bit different. It's the inclusion of the word patient. Correct. Okay. Additionally, um, the vague use of the word collaboration uh, with the physician or surgeon, um, uh, which does not require more specific oversight supervision, of, um, such as physical therapists are required to obtain a diagnosis uh, within a period of time. There's no indication anywhere of a time frame for an athletic trainer to necessarily have have uh, their patient uh, receive a diagnosis for them to be able to provide um, intervention and treatment. Okay. On a positive note, um, there is a, a sub, there is an, another bill that is a little bit further down the road uh, in our um, agenda that they are seeking title protection, which is, I absolutely fully support. So I'm not opposed to athletic trainers. I'm opposed, this opposition is about athletic trainers being able to do more than what they, than what should be within their scope in training. <clears throat> so demographic being treated and level of supervision really are the two concerns that you would like us to address in the amendment. Those are the two primary issues for me. Okay. Yeah, I'm just kind of sitting with it all right now. This is uh, President Rubina um, Amen. I agree with you, Daniel, about the bill that's to come and the title protections. And, you know, if that bill were to go through, just wondering if this particular bill is even necessary at all. I don't, you know, they can still have their profession protected and do what they do without possibly increasing um, their scope and causing safety concerns that aren't well defined in their, you know, their training right now. Um, so this is Jason again. I think it would be consistent if the board chooses to file an opposition 3110 that you could then also provide a letter of support for the title protection bill as well. You mean 1665 instead of 3110? Correct. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm referring to old, old news. So I guess um, I, I would I would lean toward a letter of opposition versus a letter of opposition ver uh, with the amendment. Um, how do board members feel about that versus the original motion? This is Katarina. I like the idea of an opposition to uh, this bill and then a letter of support for the title protection. And Ms. McMillian? Uh, I'm on. <laughs> Let me think a little bit. <laughs> Let me think for a minute. Yeah, that's, that's fine. Thank you. That's okay. Um, go back to doc, uh, Dr. Dominguez. Thank you. Um, I, you know, I think it's a it's a good compromise. I think it gets those of us that might have a little, or maybe a little more than a little, concern about the the ATC curriculum preparing those practitioners to see patients potentially outside of the scope of practice and also give, you know, giving the uh, the nod to the title protection. So I, I would be in favor of that. I know Daniel had, had laid out a two 
uh, major concerns and how we would craft those amendments to, to sound reasonable to uh, the athletic training profession. I, I don't know if it would be received well, but I think this is a way for us to support title protection and still um, you know, feel confident that we're protecting the public by opposing 1665. This is Jason again, um, and again, however the board chooses, even if you were to take a, a, a position of oppose on 1665, we would certainly still include what the board's concerns were in that opposition. This is Jesus. Thanks for the, the clarification, Jason. I didn't want to just make it sound like, you know, thumbs down without some sort of rationale. Ditto with uh, 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 what you just stated, this is Tanya. Me too. The same, as long as there's some kind of note that follows the oppose, that works for me. Thank you. And Dr. Drummer? Uh, this is Daniel. Um, and two years ago, uh, we had almost this same discussion that there was concern about taking a full oppose um, position um, and the the thoughts at that time were to soften it a little bit by saying oppose unless it was amended uh, and if amended language was or if amendments were were added so that it addressed our concerns then we would be in support. Um, in my in my way of thinking, the language right now is the language right now, and a, a motion to oppose, in my mind, is a motion is exactly that we're opposing the language. If somebody comes back with different language, then we would we would and could um, or we could and potentially would revise our oppose to um, to an accept or to a support. Um, this time, uh, taking that from last time is why I chose to use the language, um, this time for oppose unless amended. Uh, but if, um, if other board members are willing to just oppose, then I, I would support that. Uh, and then, as I said, um, once we get down to the, the title protection bill, um, I'm, I am fully supportive of that. Thanks for that, Dr. Drama. That makes sense and makes me think that I could actually go either way. Um, but we've got a motion and we've got a second, unless you want to amend the first motion. Um, just one more kind of little tidbit from the administrative side. Uh, recalling conversations that we've had about language like this in the past, I think the board has always taken a very measured um, approach. Um, and in that caution, you know, as Dr. Zummer stated, um, wanting to soften the language a little bit with opposed and less amended, um, the language has not changed over time. Um, and, and, and so I also concur with his assessment that it is just an opposition of the existing language. Even the idea of um, amending and making suggestions about the two, you know, primary causes for concern, they're not very specific um, proposed amendments to the existing language, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, they're conceptual, but they're not technical in nature. So, um, as the administrator um, and having experienced this um, particular topic in legislation four, five times now, um, <laughs> I, I think the board has already demonstrated its patience um, and consideration of author's language. So um, I don't feel as strongly as I might have last time or provided um, guidance last time that it should be a softer um, opposed and less amended language. I opposed at this point, I think it's pretty much the same thing. And given the, the current uh, state of affairs with COVID-19 and this, very hectic and rapid um, legislative process, I think it's probably more effective and more efficient. This is Jesus. Jason, good point. I think from the, the flavor of our conversation here is that we're, for the most part, I think we're all 
of the same uh, opinion. We know what we don't like about the bill. And I think we can lay that argument out, which we have before, easier than trying to sort of craft what we would like to see change about the bill. So I, I'd be in favor of just a, a straight opposition with, with the provided rationale. And just one more thing to add, as the administrator, I will always encourage the board to take that very measured and well thought out approach um, to any kind of controversial legislative language that of this nature. I mean, you guys always do a really good job of that, and I think that's the expectation. Thank you, Jason. We appreciate you for that, too. This is Jesus. Apparently, many people appreciate you, Jason. You guys, you guys heard that grandma in the background, huh? <laughs> I appreciated it. Dr. Drummer, would you like to go forward with your first motion? Or do, would you like to change your, your motion? I was just wondering if I had heard an amendment by Dr. Dominguez to strike uh, unless amended from the original motion. You, and if, and if, he did, if he did, then I would second that amendment. Uh, this is Jesus. Thank you, Dr. Drummer. Um, no, I was sort of waiting. You know, you are the authority on Robert's rules here. But uh, uh, I know that, that your motion was to oppose with, uh, with amendments. And I think our conversation took us away from that. So do, do we now... <laughs> take a vote on, or can I amend your original motion, even though I, I seconded it? Seconded so, it? Too many did it? So, hey, um, legal so, counsel, the, the best uh, approach would be to, um, for Dr. Drummer to amend the original motion. If the second agrees, we move forward. So a primary motion was, a primary, a, a primary motion was made by me it's open for amendment to be able to modify it before the final vote on that primary motion. The main motion is made. Um, so my main motion was made and it was seconded by Dr. Dominguez, I believe. Uh, and then Dr. Dominguez kind of sort of hinted, hinted at an amendment to strike the words uh, unless amended. Uh, so we were not intending to provide amendments ourselves but we were taking a position of oppose unless amended. And so if Dr. Dominguez did intend to move to amend by striking the words unless amended, then I would second that amendment and we would vote on that amendment and then we would move towards the main motion, which was would then be, if the amendment got adopted, we would then be discussing the motion to oppose. Period. This is, Dr. Drummer, is Dr. Drummer, legal counsel. I I don't think we would generally vote to amend an emotion that hasn't taken been, had action taken on it yet. I do believe that if the it, there, there's a couple procedures that boards usually follow here. One is to simply with the um, agreement of the maker of the motion, and the second to withdraw the motion and remake it, or that the maker of the original motion would propose to amend their motion and then the second could agree and, and re-second the motion. If the desire if the desire is to to uh, to not follow Robert's rules, then I would remove okay. I would move to just revise my original motion then. to remove the words unless opposed, or unless amended, I'm sorry. So uh, it would be that we, um, the language again. There we are. The motion would then be to authorize the executive officer and staff to develop a letter of opposition for AB 1665. This is Jesus. 
with uh, <laughs> with council's oversight, of course, and guidance. Uh, what he said. I would second. <laughs> Is that a second? <laughs> this is Asus. Yes, it is. Okay. Madam President, yes, it is. Thank you. Okay. So we do have um, an amended motion, a revised motion to oppose, and we have a uh, by Dr. Drummer, and we have a second by Dr. Dominguez. And I would like to now open the discussion for public comment um, and encourage public. I, I think I do see a few names on there that could be the public who are in attendance. Um, and if you would like to uh, type in a question, please participate. We'd love to hear from you. Moderator, please open the lines as appropriate. All right, this is the moderator speaking. I have opened up the Q&A feature in WebEx for um, public comment. Uh, members of the public, if you would like to make a public comment, please click on the icon with a question mark in the square located at the bottom center of your WebEx screen. We're currently sharing instructions on the slide now. And I will pause a moment to allow the public to access that Q&A feature. Okay, moderator. This is the moderator. It looks like there are no requests for public comment. Would you like me to close the Q&A feature now? Yes, please. Thank you. All right, Q&A feature is now closed. Okay, and we do have that motion, revised motion to oppose um, 1665. Well, the motion was to um, direct staff to craft a letter of opposition and so uh, the second one's made by Dr. Dominguez, and I will have a roll call vote, please. Alicia Benjamin, aye. Jesus Dominguez? Aye. Daniel Drummer? Aye. Katerina Elby? Aye. Tanya McMillian? Aye. Five to zero, motion carries. Thank you. The next bill on the legislative summary is AB 1850, Worker Classification, Employees, and Independent Contractors. Uh, this bill is in the Senate, Senate pending referral to Policy Committee. This bill is one of the vehicles to address the Dynamex um, decision and AB 5 um, as a cleanup. As drafted, this bill revises certain criteria governing the classification of employees and exempts specified occupations from the legal test uh, formulated and required in AB5 with the Dynamex decision. Newly exempted professions um, include musicians, rec recording artists, insurance inspectors, competition judges, appraisers, master class teachers, freelance writers, certified translators, editors, copy, copy editors, illustrators, uh, newspaper cartoonists, photographers, photojournalists, videographers, uh, photo editors, among some others, um, and they would all be subject to the multi-factor test um, from SG Borello and Sons versus the Department of Industrial Relations. The next bill on the summary is AD 1904, uh, pelvic floor physical therapy coverage, and this bill is dead. This bill would have required a health care service plan, contract, or health insurance policy issued, amended, or renewed on or after January 1st, 2021 to provide coverage for pelvic floor physical therapy after pregnancy. The next uh, bill is AD 2028 state agencies uh, meeting, and this is currently in the Senate and was just referred to the Senate Governmental Organizational Co Organization Committee. Uh, this bill would require all writings and materials, unless exempted, 
um, provided to members of state bodies that notice meetings by staff or another member to be included and posted with the agenda for the meeting on the internet or either the same day as they are provided to the members um, or at least 48 hours in advance of the meeting, whichever is earlier. The state body may only discuss these materials at the meeting if the notice requirements have been followed. Um, this bill does provide that the requirement does not apply to writings or materials prepared um, for a matter to, to be discussed in closed session of the state body. This bill also specifies that if relevant writings and materials are related to current legislation, a state body is entitled to post online additional materials related to that active legislation as it becomes available. This is Dr. Avina Engman. So does this mean that when you send board members agenda materials, they're also at the same day posted? Is that what this is saying? Correct, unless it is pertaining to closed session or um, legislation as it moves along, we could um, add additional meeting materials to the website. Okay. Um, this is hours, whichever is soonest. So, um, this board, we try to get you guys the materials in as much time in advance as possible, because there's usually a lot. Um, in, doing, in, in, in thinking of the way this bill would impact us, um, two things come to mind. One would be we are not um, the web, um, the word. Yeah, yeah. The, the webmaster of our own website, and so we have to submit a request. Um, and, in, and in that case, I would actually have, even though the materials were done and prepared and ready to send out to members, I could not provide them to you until I knew they had hit the website. Um, and then I guess the second part of that, maybe a little bit larger of a notion, is because we provide the content and the material that far in advance, um, we also do it for the public, and we're not really the topic or the subject of this particular legislation. Mm -hmm. We are. Uh, really, if you think about the intent of this legislation, we are in full compliance with what they're trying to attain on a, a regular basis. So um, I, I do think that there are some difficulties here in the delivery. Um, obviously, I think it's doable. We'd be able to do it. It's just there's a few kind of things that we would have to work out, and ultimately um, it might delay how quickly we could actually provide the materials to our membership. Does the board member have a question or a comment? This is Daniel. Um, I just want to make sure that I'm a little I'm concerned that if a last minute item needs to come up, uh, needs, there have been a few times when we've had information provided, but I believe at least the topic has been uh, been provided in the agenda, which is submitted two weeks before, at least two weeks before our meetings generally, correct? And this is not about the specific agenda book, the complete um, list of all the items and the discussion points, but it's really more about just the agenda. I'm reading it to include materials all writings or materials provided for a notice meeting to a member of a state body. So do we post our agenda book ahead of time? We do. Not as not as, as far in advance as we do the agenda itself. But the materials um, usually go out the week before the meeting. And when I say go out, I mean post to our website. Right. We usually send it to you two weeks in advance, and then a week later, because of that request we make to the webmaster to post it up, um, sometimes it takes a little, there's a time delay in between those two points. And so this would, this would preclude us from being able to have any information handed out on site? Or discuss any topics based on handouts. We would have to either schedule that topic for a later meeting, which could be, um, you know, in an emergent situation, require an emergency teleconference or WebEx, if you, if you will. Um, 
but you wouldn't, we, it would prohibit us from being able to discuss that topic because the materials were not provided to the public in what the legislation considers to be a timely manner. But it does say on the same day as they are disseminated to members of the body for at least 48 hours. So it could be 48 hours before you give something to us and you post something or attempt to post something, right? Well, if I remember correctly in the actual bill language, it's whichever is soonest. Right, so the trigger actually occurs once once we disseminate the materials to the board members, we should have also put them on the website for public. Everything should be available. Correct. So if it's not, and like Dr. Drummer's saying, we're here for a meeting and we're given supplemental materials and it's also made available for the public in the back of the room to, to take and review, um, we can discuss those things, but we cannot necessarily um, as the administrator, if this law were to pass, um, I would be very hesitant to ever do handouts. Mm -hmm. right? it, it would be one of those things where <clears throat> unless I could guarantee that I got them out prior to that 48-hour cutoff and I was able to both get them to you as members and have them posted to the website simultaneously. Mm -hmm. Okay. But after that 48-hour cutoff, if we didn't get it to you, you wouldn't get it as a handout, and we would have to move that topic to a later meeting. So this is Daniel. Um, just looking at today's agenda, for example, um, their uh, item six, the executive officer's report, simply has an item listed as relocation, ETBC relocation. Without additional materials, it does, would we be precluded from discussing that? Um, additionally, Jason, your report included information about the new positions, um, uh, the uh, changes with uh, operations because of COVID, with staff at home and furloughs, et cetera. Would we be precluded from discussing those items? Um, the way I understand it, both the president's report and the executive officer's report the title are a little, it's a little bit more broad. The specificity that kind of happens in the subsection is um, kind of a guide. You know, typically in the past you've seen under executive office report, I'll have A through F, and I kind of um, bullet point and boilerplate some of those things just in case. But I could leave them out entirely and just leave it titled Executive Officer's Report. And all I'm really doing is bringing to the attention of the board highlights from some of the rest of the materials that I want them to focus on. Um, okay. And they're not printed materials in advance, um, and they don't really fit in any other particular category very well. Um, so I don't think in either in the President's Report or the Executive Officer's Report, it would be too affected by this legislation, but I'll ask Council to kind of chime in make sure that I'm interpreting it correctly. Michael Knuth, yeah, I think that's, uh, that's, that's correct, Mr. Kaiser. The, the biggest difference is really just the, the matter of if there is a handout that must be provided or it can't be discussed. So um, thank you for that. This is Daniel again. So for example, then looking at the um, jurisprudence at the JAM, presentation, the law exam and jam presentation that we had. Um, and then we ended up taking action on that. Would that presentation have been required to be made available beforehand and not just presented to us at, at this meeting? If it was a presentation by board staff, I would say certainly yes. It, it, as an outside presenter, that's an interesting question if the, if the bill were to pass, because they're not necessarily materials provided by the board to the board members. So that's a, um, perhaps that's uh, an, an area that the bill could be more specific about. And as a presentation by itself, I would be okay with it just being there and, you know, and then presentation and potentially some questions to the presenter. But that this particular item ended up leading to us taking action, which to me takes it a step further without having 
any other information, descriptive information being included in our agenda about it. So yeah, yeah, it's of, an interesting topic. And this is Jason again. One of the other issues that I think that that creates is, um, especially with this, this given like specific example is, we might find our guests are not able to provide us that kind of information that far in advance. And, and, and maybe that even impacts their ability to be a guest at a particular meeting, uh, which I think could create, you know, untimely delays of how quickly we can move on things with other organizations or entities. Um, but certainly an interesting conversation. Thank you, Dr. Drummer. AB 2113, um, Refugees, Asylees, and Immigrants, um, Professional Licensing. This bill is in the Senate pending referral to Policy Committee. This bill would require programs within DCA to expedite and assist the initial licensure process for an applicant, applicant who, supply, who supplies satisfactory evidence that they are a refugee, have been granted political asylum, or have a special immigrant visa as specified. The bill would authorize programs to adopt regulations necessary to administer these provisions. What type of impact does this bill have on our board? Um, anecdotally speaking, I think if you look at the process that our applicants have to go through when they are non-CAPTI accredited, um, foreign trained, if you will, um, an expedite might not the way that the language is formed is it's an expedite, but they still have to meet the requirements of licensure. Um, the pathway for a foreign trained physical therapist to come into the United States um, often includes up to a nine month clinical experience to be completed before a license can be issued. And even before that, a very extensive evaluation of that person's educational um, criteria to determine if it's equivalent to that of the same graduation year in the United States. So an expedite really doesn't turn into an expedite at, you know, at that time. Um, and it would be a little bit different if this language had said something like the issuance of a temporary license until all requirements are met and then a, a regular matriculated license could be issued. But just expediting the license and still fulfilling the requirements of licensure kind of negate each other. Mm -hmm. They almost cancel each other out. Thank you. AB 2185, Professions and Vocations, Applicants, Licensed in Other State, Reciprocity. Uh, this bill is dead. This bill would have required each program in the DCA subject to specified exemptions to um, issue a license to an applicant if the applicant, applicant had held a license from another state that was in good standing in the discipline and practice level. And if the applicant met certain requirements, including but not limited to holding the out-of-state license for the past three to five years. AB 2214, um, Administrative Procedure Act, Notice of Proposed Action is another bill that was pulled and it won't move forward. Uh, this bill would have required a state agency, including programs within the DCA, to conspicuously post specified regulatory documents on its website within 24 hours of submitting a proposed action to the OAL, Office of Administrative Law. AB 2410, Athletic Trainers, is in the Senate pending referral to Policy Committee. This bill would make it unlawful for any person to hold themselves out as an athletic trainer, use the title of, among others, athletic trainer, or to use specified terms to imply or suggest that the person is an athletic trainer, unless that person fulfills certain requirements, including, including but not limited to uh, being certified by the Board of Certification, Inc., or its predecessors or successors, or by another certifying entity with comparable standards, standards for certifying athletic trainers. This bill would also make it an, an unfair business practice to use the title athletic trainer, certified trainer, or other specified terms that imply or suggest that the person is an athletic trainer if the person does not meet the requirements. This bill, notwithstanding these provisions, would authorize a person who has worked as an athletic trainer in California for a period of 20 consecutive years prior to January 1st, 2021, and he was not otherwise eligible to use the title athletic trainer to use that title. 
this bill would declare that it is to take effect immediately, immediately as an urgency statute as well. Hmm. This is Dr. Rubina Amen. Does anyone know what the significance of 20 consecutive years prior to January 1st, 2021 is? To paraphrase the um, the statement that we heard from behind uh, Ms. McMillian's microphone, uh, grandfathering. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, I understand that that concept. I'm just wondering about the 20 years, you know, specifically. Um, yeah. This is Jason. It may be just a very kind of cut and dry cutoff, um, trying to establish when athletic trainer certification and education standards were reliable. How far back can they say um, and and reliably attest to what those certification standards were at the time? Mm -hmm. Usually, with a grandfathering of any kind, um, it can be kind of. Uh, vague in the way they determined that timeline. Mm -hmm. Any other board comments? As I, this is Daniel, as I stated before, I'm in support of this bill. Um, I think that somebody who is certified as an like nobody who's not certified as an athletic trainer should be allowed to call themselves an athletic trainer um I, so i am in, i'm in support of that that aspect i do have a concern about um the urgency issue um i'm not really sure why there's an urgency um clause attached to this um I don't know that there's a giant rush of people who are for some reason waiting to call themselves athletic trainers, but. Um, so this is Jason again. Um, typically, and as you saw in the previous discussions with the other athletic trainer bill, um, a date of implementation will be put in place with an expectation of how long it, it takes to put together the regulatory body that's going to be in charge of enforcing that particular scope. In a title protection bill, um, there really isn't anyone that is tasked with enforcing this issue, per se. And so urgency is often sought because all they really want is it to just take effect once the bill is codified and that no future implementation date is necessary because there's no structure to put in place. Thank you for that clarification. I was thinking that the only the thought was in my head that it would take effect on January 1st of the, of the following calendar year automatically. But now I understand uh, with your with your description. With the president's permission, I would like to submit a motion to the the uh, that we um, ask the executive officer and staff to draft a letter of support of AB 2410. Tony second. Got a motion from Dr. Drummer and a second from Ms. McMillian. And so at this time, I would like to invite public comment um, for discussion. Moderator, please open the lines as appropriate. All right, this is the moderator and at the direction of the board, I have opened the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a public comment, uh, please click on the icon with a question mark up in a square at the lower at the bottom center of your WebEx screen. Um, we're currently sharing instructions on how to access that right now. I will now go ahead and pause a moment to allow the members of the public to access that. This is Stacy Defoe. Can everybody hear me? Yes, we can hear you. 
Okay, great. I sorry, I was um, trying to respond <laughs> earlier when um, the board was discussing um, AB twenty four ten, but I think because I'm a panelist, I my access was a little different. So um, my apologies for not um, responding earlier. Um, but I just wanted to respond to um, the current bill AB sixteen sixty five. Um, to say that um, we we are supporting the bill um, for the reasons that um, the board has outlined. Um, we believe this is a reasonable um, solution to an ongoing um, issue that's been around and, and has been trying to resolve for more than 20 years. Um, we agree that um, there isn't currently protection for um, somebody calling anybody calling themselves an athletic trainer, and um, we agree that there there should be something in place that um, addresses that. And we also believe that um, this bill addresses um, the other issues that athletic trainers have um, raised regarding um, traveling to other states um, and not without having any of uh, any regulation in California, um, this would address that issue and um, would allow them to protect their, um, their practice. So um, we're in support and we are supportive of the board's position. And um, for the record, we um, have a similar position um, to the one that the board adopted on um, AB, on AB 1665, so. Thank you. And if there are any questions for the association, we'd be happy to answer. So Stacy, this is Jason, but just to clarify, if I understand you correctly, CPTA has held an opposition on 1665, but a support on 2410. Correct, correct. And we currently have an opposed and less amended position on 1665. Um, the issues that we have, um, with the bill are similar, uh, almost exactly the ones that the board um, stated. Um, and we have not yet changed that to um, a flat oppose. Um, and we may, we may do that, um, but we are concerned um, with, the, with the supervision that's outlined. Um, we're concerned about the um, collaboration versus, versus supervision, um, we're assuming, and we're concerned about um, that this bill would really give athletic trainers the ability to diagnose because they would be able to assess and evaluate a patient's condition and then immediately offer treatment without any sort of um, input from the physician. That's one of our biggest concerns. I think that was mentioned, but not, um, I just wanted to outline it a little bit more. So currently we are opposed unless amended, but the amendments would have to be fast in order for us to support it um, and it would the bill would have to reply to athletes only and would have to have clear and concise um, regulations around the supervision and the um, assessment and evaluation so we are currently support um, opposing less amended on um, 1665 and we are in strong support of ab 2410. I'd like to pause to allow for continued public comment. So um, I'll have the moderator kind of watch out for that for us, please. This is the moderator. Um, there, just as the, at the moment, there are no requests for public comment. Do you want me to keep holding the Q and A feature open? I think we're fine to close it. Thank you for letting me know. Okay. Q and A feature is now closed. So we do have a, a motion from Dr. Drummer and a second by Dr. Dominguez um, to support AB 2410. And so can we have a roll call vote? I don't know that we have a second. Oh, I thought Tanya. we, oh, Tanya, I'm Tanya. sorry. Yep, this is Jesus. Yes. Tanya did yes. second. I, I would be happy. Nice. Yep. Thank you both. My apologies. So a motion from Dr. Drummer and a second by Ms. McMillian. And so uh, that's for a letter of support by staff. 
for 2410. And we'll take a roll call vote. Alicia Benayman? Yes. Ms. Dominguez? Aye. Daniel Drummer? Aye. Katerina Ellaby? Aye. Tanya McMillian? Aye. Five to zero, motion carried. Thank you. AB 2549 DCA temporary licenses is in the Senate pending referral to policy committee. This bill adds specified licensing boards to the list of boards that are required to issue temporary licenses to applicants who meet certified specified requirements, including that the applicant supplies satisfactory evidence that they are married to or in a domestic partnership or other legal union with an active duty member of the United States Armed Forces who is stationed in California under official active duty military orders, and that the applicant holds the current active and unrestricted license that confers upon the applicant that the authority to practice in another state, district, or ter territory of the U.S., the profession or vocation for which the applicant seeks a temporary license from the board. Um, there were a couple recent amendments to this bill. Um, one included extending the time frame for boards to provide approved draft regulations to the DCA from January 1st, 2021 to January 1st, 2022. In addition, Jason and I worked with the author's office to include the second amendment, which states that the provision shall not apply to a board that has a process in place by which an out-of-state licensed applicant good standing who is married to or in a domestic partnership or other legal union with an active duty member of the armed forces of the U.S. is able to receive expedited temporary authorization to practice while meeting state-specific requirements for a period of at least one year. And this language will exempt us from this bill as we have a similar process of temporary licensure in place, uh, PTLA, PTALA status. Okay. AB 2631, license fees, military partners and spouses was pulled and will not be moving forward. Uh, this bill would have required programs within DCA to waive initial or original licensing fees for spouses and domestic partners of active duty military members. Uh, AB 2684, occupational therapy and physical therapy services work group was also pulled and will not be moving forward. Uh, this bill would have required the Commission on Teachers Credentialing to convene a work group to consider whether the development of a ser uh, services credential with a specialization in occupational therapy or physical therapy services um, was warranted. Um, AB 2704, healing, life, healing Arts Licensees Data Collection is dead. Uh, this bill would have standardized the licensee demographic data that must be collected by all healing arts boards. Um, aggregate information collected would have been required to be posted on each board's website and then provided to the Office of Statewide Health Planning and Development. AB 2978, um, DOJ Arrest and Conviction Records Review, has been pulled and will not be um, moving forward. Um, pursuant to AB 1076, uh, the Department of Justice is now required beginning January 1st, 2021, to review statewide criminal justice databases and identify individuals who are eligible for arrest record relief or automatic conviction record relief by having their arrest records or criminal conviction records withheld from disclosure or modified. Uh, current law provides that individuals are eligible for eligible individuals who are eligible for this relief among other criteria if the arrest or conviction occurred on or after Jan January 1st, 2021. So this bill would have instead required that the arrest or conviction occurred on or after January 1st, 1973. AB 3045, uh, DCA Boards, Veterans, Military Spouses, Licenses is in the Senate pending referral to a policy committee. This bill would require certain regulatory boards to grant licenses to an applicant who is either a veteran or the spouse of a partner of an active duty member of the armed forces if the applicant holds a qualified license in another state. AB 
AB 878 DCA licensing applications wait time was just ordered to the assembly yesterday. Um, this bill would require each licensing program within the DCA to at least quarterly prominently display on its website the current average time frame for processing initial and renewal license applications for each license it offers or the combined average time frames for processing initial and renewal applications. Um, this bill was recently amended in the Senate on uh, June 18th. And the main amendments um, were to, one, delay the implementation date to July 1st, 2021. Also, to clarify that displaying the specified time frame information um, be done on at least a quarterly basis. Um, another amendment was to authorize each program to display either the current average or the combined current average time frame for processing initial and renewal license applications on its website. And the last amendment was um, authorize each program to, to display either the current average or the combined average time frame for processing each license type that the program administers on its website. Um, SB 1054, Physical Therapy Licensure Compact is dead. Um, this bill would have entered California into the Physical Therapy Licensure Compact, an interstate licensure agreement that provides licensing reciprocity for PTs and PTAs. As a member of the PT Compact, PT and PTAs in other compact states would be eligible to practice physical therapy in California, and California's PT and PTAs would likewise be eligible to practice in those states as well. Um, SB 1168, State Agencies Licensing Services, was held on the Senate Appropriations Suspense File and is dead. Uh, this bill would have, among other provisions, required state agencies that issue business and professional licenses to expedite licensing services for individuals or businesses that were displaced or had experienced economic hardship due to an emergency or an emergency caused by a virus. Thank you, Brett. Anything else? So good. No, that's it. And so I want to invite um, board member comments, questions. Okay. This is Jesus. Sorry. Madam President, uh, no comments other than to say thank you, Brooke, for doing this. It makes it so much more consumable when you go through these rather than uh, reading them on your own. You tend to highlight things that are important. So I thank you for that. Well, my pleasure. Thank you. This is Daniel. Um, a question come, I'm just wondering um, if uh, perhaps Jason can um, address uh, AB 3045, um, granting a license to an applicant who is a veteran or a spouse um, of an active duty member who holds a qualified license in another state. Um, and earlier you um, described a proposed amendment um, to another bill, which because we have a process in place for people to apply for licenses, would that same thing, would we seek that same thing here or is it not? Is it different? Uh, that's, a, that's a good catch, Dr. Drummond. Um, it had, in early conversations, it had crossed my mind to kind of seek the same amendment for this particular bill, but this bill um, is specific in nature for endorsement applicants. So they've been licensed in another state. Um, and I think it's, it runs in the same direction of which we're moving as a board when it comes to reciprocity and um, diverting resources to those endorsement applicants. Uh, in the past, when we're processing an endorsement applicant, we have treated those endorsement applicants the way we would treat any applicant. We're asking for transcripts from schools or certificate of completion of degree, um, test scores from FSBPT or whatever, um, organization was actually holding the national exam at the time. Um, and so where most people would think an endorsement application would be quicker because they've got license somewhere else. In fact, sometimes it takes a little bit longer. Um, we're moving more to a reciprocity model. Um, as time has gone on, 
the the national standards have kind of equalized amongst the states, if you will. We all hold the same score and pass point. Um, we all use the same CAPD certification. And so if they were licensed in another state, it's fair to say that those states are equivalent to those requirements in California. And so this bill doesn't concern me. Um, we think that the endorsement application process in California um, over the next few months and with kind of shifting resources around internally are going to address it as well as all other endorsement applicants and expedite that process. Thank you. Any other board comment or question regarding the bill? And Brooke did discuss many of the bills, so I would like to now open the discussion for any public comment. Moderator, can you please open the lines as appropriate? This is the moderator. At the direction of the board, I have opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Uh, members of the public, if you would like to make a public comment, please click on the icon with a question mark within a square located at the bottom center of your WebEx screen. We're currently sharing instructions on how to access that right now. And I will pause a moment to allow the public to access the Q&A feature. This is the moderator. It looks like there are no requests for public comment. Would you like me to close the Q&A feature now? Yes, yeah, thank you so much. The Q&A feature is now closed. Thank you. Uh, and this is Jason. Before we move on to the next agenda item, I'd just like to kind of echo um, Dr. Dominguez's comments. Um, Brooke Arneson has managed this particular legislation, legislative session extremely well. Um, I don't consider myself an unintelligent man, but finding information about bills lately has been very difficult to do. Um, as soon as you think you know a bill is pretty much, it is what it is, you find out within a few days it's been amended, it's moved on to a new committee, and all that information is very difficult to find. And without Brooke, I would not have found it. So, you know, I just want to um, express my appreciation for her and her support during this session. Thank you, Brooke. Thank you for working hard for us. Okay, agenda item number 12, the rulemaking report. Okay, so the rulemaking update, it begins on page 101 of the meeting materials and our update is based off the rulemaking calendar that was adopted by the board at the December 2019 meeting. Uh, the first um, item on the rulemaking report is the setting examination score. Um, and this package was um, submitted to DCA Legal for review of June of 2019. In mid-February mid 2020, DCA Legal provided board staff with their suggested edits and board staff resubmitted the rulemaking package for initial phase review to D DCA Legal June 2020. The next item on the rulemaking report is the disciplinary guidelines. And the disciplinary guidelines um, was amended at the June 2019 board meeting. Um, and that was due to the passage of AB 2138. Um, in June 2019, board staff forwarded the initial rulemaking package to DCA legal. Um, and then uh, we submitted it to DCA legal uh, June of 2019. You know, we've been working with um, the regulation unit on um, amendments and changes on that package. The next item is the satisfactory evidence of equivalent degree for licensure as a PT or PTA, um, the coursework tool regulation. And this package was submitted to DCA Legal for initial review in November 2019. Uh, board staff have been working with legal on suggested edits. And in June 2020, the initial rulemaking package was submitted to DCA Legal for review. The FSPPT 
Tech for foreign educated physical therapists completing a supervised clinical practice in the U.S. rulemaking package was submitted to DCA Legal for pre-review in November 2019, and board staff worked with Legal on suggested edits, and in June of 2020, the rulemaking package was submitted to DCA Legal for initial phase review. The substantial relationship criteria, rehab criteria for denial and reinstatement of licensure, and rehab criteria for suspension and revocations rulemaking package was submitted to DCA Legal for review in October of 2019. On December 26, the initial rulemaking package was submitted to agency, and in February 2020, agency provided the board with non-substantive edits. CTBC staff worked with DCA Legal to address these edits and resubmitted the package back to agency for review, and it was approved on April 16, 2020. It will be published by OAL on June 26, and the 45-day public period will end on August 10, 2020. And all other items on the rulemaking tracking form are for potential rulemaking packages that will be presented to the board for consideration in the upcoming year. The board have any questions on any of the rulemaking items? Questions or comments from board members? Okay, I'm going to open it up for discussion with public comment. Moderator, please open the lines as appropriate. Great, this is the moderator, and at the direction of the board, I will be opening up the Q&A portion of WebEx. Members of the public, if you would like to make a public comment, please click on the icon with a question mark within a square located at the bottom center of your WebEx screen. There are currently instructions up on the slide deck right now for your reference. And I will pause to allow the public access to time to access the uh, Q and A feature. All right, this is the moderator. It looks like there are no requests for public comment. Would you like me to close the Q&A portion now? Yes, please, thank you. All right, the Q&A portion is now closed. Thank you. We're gonna just keep going forward. Number 13, administrative services. So um, due to the effects of COVID-19 and us having to have this kind of um, abbreviated WebEx meeting. You guys are stuck with me to provide um, the materials for the next coming agenda items. Um, we'll start with um, the budget report, um, which you'll see different in this budget report from what you're familiar with saying in the past is that there's actually no display, um, a line by line item that kind of shows you where we are. Um, we have been working with DCA and we have made progress on um, reconciling our reports through fiscal. Um, as you might remember as members, we've had struggles with fiscal in the past for quite some time. Um, and we're actually making some, some significant progress, but we're not able to reconcile our numbers in that display with what we're seeing in fiscal just yet. So um, look for that display to be provided to you in next, um, the next meeting's materials. But in the briefing paper, you'll see a basic um, description of bottom line budgeting, where we are, how much we spent of our significant budget, um, given the time frame, and we're right on track. Essentially, there has been some cost savings that we've been able to um, trim the fat, if you will, in some areas, um, and we have had some salary savings with um, not hiring an assistant executive officer just yet. Um, and a couple different recruitments that have taken quite a while. So, unless you have any questions about um, 
budget or any of the uh, fiscal issues, I'd be happy to hear them. So this is Dr. Rabina Amen. Um, when we meet again, will we, can we expect that we'll see similar reports that we've seen in the past? Absolutely. And will we see reports um, for both what we might have expected to see for this meeting as well as the next meeting? Um, potentially. I don't know, because they're capture and time reports, yes. I don't know um, that we're able, that we will be able to like retroactively reconcile the accounts to mm -hmm. kind of come up with those numbers, but we'll attempt to do so. Thank you. Other um, board member comments, questions? Uh, this is Daniel. Sorry, go ahead. No, please go ahead, sir. Uh, just wanting to confirm that because no no large red flags were raised, that there are no red flags. <laughs> I am happy to say that there are no large red flags. Um, we're, we're really talking about in reconciling what Fiscal has versus what we have matters of dollars and pennies. Um, we're not off the mark. We're just not 100% accurate at this point. We're still trying to figure that out. And a lot of it has to do with how we report and how fiscal classifies or, you know, the classifications within the fiscal system and how they're reported. This is Jesus. Um, Jason, I'm just sort of peripherally related to the budget. I know you reported it, reported on the budget with your uh, EL report. But anecdotally, anecdotally, have we heard of any licensee that is having difficulty uh, paying their license renewal fee because of potential furlough or, or uh, you know, being laid off or any of those kinds of things? I imagine it's probably still too early and the impact on our budget is probably limited best um, I'll you know I'll address it two ways anecdotally yes we have heard from some licensees that they have um, financial difficulties given on um, COVID-19 not able to work um, inquiring whether or not there are going to be waivers for renewal fees if they actually have a financial hardship um, discretionally we've provided um, uh, let's say we've not charged delinquency fees for some of those folks, um, given their circumstances, just kind of on a discretionary measure. Um, on a larger budget scale, um, there is kind of a downtick in revenues received, um, and I would probably attribute that to COVID-19, but I don't have anything concrete to point to that. I think it's expected a little bit to see it that way. It could be anomalous. Um, but if I had to guess, I would say the revenue downtick as a, is a, a result of COVID-19. Um, and then again, you know, I, I think it's affected, you know, all, all California citizens, citizens of the United States for that matter, and physical therapy has not been spared. This is Jesus. Thank you, Jason. I, you know, obviously it's, we're all living under this new world and uh, sort of glad to see that the board is sort of, um, you know, extending, um, you know, discretionary measures to try and uh, relieve some of the financial burden that our licensees are, are currently experiencing. So thank you for that. Hopefully, you know, the world gets back to the new normal. Things go in the right direction. Any other board comments for number thirteen? Administrative services, budget. Um, before we move on to the next section of the administrative, uh, administrative report, um, if it's okay with the board that we could take a, a five or 10 minute bio break. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, the time is 2.29, So let's take uh, 10 minutes. 10 minutes and be back right at 2.40 and we'll continue with agenda item um, 13 B and C. Thank you.
take a roll call. Oh, okay. Yeah, we'll wait. Okay. This is the moderator. Did you want to go through a roll call just to make sure everyone's back? I think that's a great idea. Thank you. Alicia Benayman? Here. Jesus Dominguez? Present. Daniel Drummer? I'm here. Katerina Ellaby? Present. Tanya McMillian? Present. All members are present and the board has a quorum. Thank you. Okay, um, and this is Jason Kaiser subbing in for um, staff from the admin unit. Um, unless there are any questions on the budget report itself, I'll move on to the next um, agendized item, which is outreach. And these reports should be very familiar to you as members. Um, it's just our effort at kind of keeping track of our progress with um, website, social media, increases, looking for anomalies, looking for things that we might be able to address. Um, there's really, you know, I'm not going to be able to provide this information to you as eloquently as April could. Um, so, again, I'll leave it to questions. If you have any questions, I will try to interpret the data and provide as an accurate as an explanation as possible. This is Dr. Rubina Alman. Do we share posts that we like from other um, Facebook sites? Do we ever see something that, like, oh, that's great, we're going to share that? Yeah, we do that both with Facebook and Twitter. Um, and so you might see things from uh, educational programs throughout the United States, um, PT programs. Um, CPTA most certainly, FSPPT's content we've shared on occasion. Um, FSPPT might throw out on Twitter an update about the MPT and we'll turn around and reiterate it for them. Um, also, um, CPTA campaigns like moveforward.org provides content about um, lifestyle and certain modalities that um, people might be able to use from the comfort of their own homes, COVID-19 articles, um, yeah, absolutely. Oh, um, right now, as part of the content that we provide uh, as a board within the Department of Consumer Affairs, we have another campaign running simultaneously about the census in California. Thank you. What other questions or comments do board members have about outreach? One of the things that I think I'll draw your attention to um, in the briefing paper is that you know, prior to COVID-19, we were uh, making really good progress at reaching out to each and every PT and PTA program in the state. Uh, we were on track for being done before the end of the year. Um, and I think you've probably heard us talk about it in previous meetings that April Beauchamp's goal is that prior to the next time we have to address the strategic plan, we will have um, either attended singly at least once each and every PT and PTA program in the state of California, as well as just repetitive and ongoing outreach to all their graduating classes. Um, since since um, COVID-19, obviously some of those appointments that we had to provide outreach presentations to school programs have been canceled. Um, we are now looking at and experimenting with the idea of doing those remotely, either via WebEx or Microsoft Teams um, or Zoom, uh, either in person or through a, a slideshow, if you will. Um, and I think one of our, probably the first kind of guinea pig in that would be um, Gurnick Academy. So we're in, the, we're in talks with them for that right now. Um, again, it's not ideal. We'd like to get out there and, and get this information to the graduating classes um, to, you know, have applicants be the most informed that they can be before they go to take the first prudence exam, but what the expectation is of them when they become professional license holders. But um, right now, you know, 12 out of 16 PT programs is um, laudable, and 6 out of 16 PTA programs 
Um, I think we would have been real close to 10 if COVID hadn't hit. So uh, we'll work for coming up with new ways to continue to increase those numbers. Um, the other issue is just because of COVID-19, we're trying to leverage technology as much as possible. And so kind of trying in, in, in the same means or the same lines of keeping in contact with the programs and providing updated information. Um, we're going to work with program directors looking for content that they want to see. And some of those things could include um, application processing timelines, um, differences in some of the waivers that we provided and how they affect licensees and providing that information on social media in the hopes that the program directors will encourage their graduating classes to hop onto those social media sites and get that information in real time. Um, we've kind of spoken about frustrations about not being our own webmaster of our own website. Um, real, when we use social media, it's pretty much real time. We can put posts up same day and it's pretty easy. And so I think the more that we can get some of those applicants shifted over, uh, hopefully they continue to like us once they become licensees and the social media can actually be a very reliable source of information for the population. This is Dr. Rabina Amen. I think hitting applicants with who we are and what we do is valuable. If they choose not to follow our social media after graduation, um, at least they've had that initial introduction and those initial presentations so that they probably know even a little bit more than some of us who have been licensed for a long time. And that's a good thing because we're doing a good job reaching out to applicants, I, I think. Um, we're doing pretty good with licensees with some of the things we have going on. Um, and what about our consumers? That's always the hard or difficult population to, um, to reach. And one of the ways that we can reach them is through our applicants and licensees. Mm -hmm. If we have informed applicants and licensees they, who know what the board is, what the board does, they can share information um, mm -hmm. with the consumers. If applicants from the get-go um, were aware of progress notes that come out twice a year, were aware of where to find things on the website, they could share those types of things with consumers, which I think might be one of the best avenues for um, public outreach. So um, that, that's a great thing. I think um, maybe coming up with ways to reach out to existing licensees, um, you know, and maybe even in the same format, you know, digitally, a presentation over, you know, an online platform of some sort. Um, I know, of course, many times you, you talk to your colleagues who are working at different places and they have questions, you know, like all of us have questions, board type questions. And, um, you know, a half hour lunch and learn um, presentation with uh, board staff might go a long way for those licensees themselves and also for those that they serve as patients and clients. So a couple of things that we can do better moving forward in the future to kind of reach out to consumers and even to the existing licensing population is explore new avenues of delivery. Um, you've all heard me kind of you know, fantasize is probably the best word, um, but it seems like that right now <laughs> about the physical therapy board having its own app, you know, mm -hmm. on their phone for applicants and then carrying on into as one of their licensees and providing information to them about the, the transactions that they might have to um, deal with with the board moving forward. Um, it's not something that we have stopped continue, you know, stop researching. It's still something that we're looking at doing. Um, COVID and resources and issues like that have definitely impacted progress, but it's, it's, it's absolutely something that we're still going to continue to pursue. Um, also working with um, hospital associations and health networks, um, Kaiser North, Kaiser South, 
UCLA, um, UC Davis hospital systems, those kind of things to try and provide information that they can pass on to the consumers is something that we're looking at now also. Um, we've experimented with it a little bit in the past with um, UCLA, but I think we can maximize the potential of that particular vehicle. So, uh, again, it's, it's definitely something that's on the radar to be done. I think uh, priority and more bang for the buck kind of happens with applicants and licensees first. And I agree with you. I think our licensees are our best word of mouth advertising. Um, and so you will see us post social media kind of geared both to applicants and licensees, but kind of hinting to them that if they know someone that might benefit from the content we provide, mm -hmm. please ask them to consider, you know, liking our page or following us on Twitter. Um, and, and there is, you know, some things that we're working on in the background to kind of make social media a little bit easier to manage. Um, software that, you know, you can purchase that essentially creates a control panel that you post once and you're actually posting to all your different um, social media channels mm -hmm. at the same time. So um, with those, I think we'll also become more efficient over time. Thank you. Other board comments or questions? Jason. All right. Um, so the next item is, you know, something that we've been wanting to do for quite a while. Um, I think I've had a conversation with each and every board member um, since I came to work for the physical therapy board about trying to figure out where they are in their term, who they were appointed by, you know, so on and so forth. So uh, Brooke has helped us out with a graphic that I think has about as much information that you can possibly cram into a single graphic. Um, you know, one of the things that I think that's hard for people to understand is that the terms themselves are static and people come into them um, at any given point. And so I think this visual kind of demonstrates that really well. Um, it shows who held the position um, before you it shows um, when your term is up, and you know, you'll see from some of the visuals that um, we have two vacancies, which is concerning, but we also have um, two members serving in their grace period. So getting appointments filled is absolutely crucial for us at this point, and I think this visual helps us really kind of bring that um, predicament to the forefront and makes it very easy for people to see it. Um, so if there's, any, if there's anything in this particular roster that you think could be done uh, that brings clarity or maybe it makes it a little bit easier to understand it, please don't hesitate to provide it to us. We will try to incorporate it. We want it to be an ongoing tool. Mm -hmm. We want to use it for the sunset purposes. We want to use it almost as, um, as you're looking at it right here, you know, you see it goes back to 2006, but I want to think of that top bar as kind of a scrolling, sliding historical bar. And so we'll continue to update it moving forward um, and still try to build back into the history so that we can go back even farther if we need to. Um, and again, you never know. Once we get that app that I'm always talking about, this might be one of those things that you could go into the app and see it at any time and scroll back as far as the physical therapy board's been in existence. When are we getting to that? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what questions do you have or comments do you have about this um, graphic that's fantastic to look at? It's a great visual. It's very easy to digest. Thank you, Brett. This is Daniel. I didn't realize that uh, both Dr. Rubina Mann and Ms. Ellaby were in we're at their grace period now. We're in jeopardy. Yes. I, okay. I will share with, with you, Dr. Drummer, and, and the rest of the board that um, I was uh, interviewed for extension, and I did. I have not heard back yet, so I don't know what the results of that interview will be. But um, I agree, kind of looking at Katerina and I, both with an exclamation point after us and two vacancies, 
um, we would not have a quorum. So. And um, question for Jason um, about communication with the governor's appointment office and then also with the um, uh, the Senate, um, I'm sorry, the Speaker of the Assembly's um, office about the vacancies. Any communication, any updates? Um, so for the governor's office, we have had conversations um, with their newly appointed secretary. Um, nothing that kind of clues us into when that vacancy will be filled, but they are aware of our concerns um, and the situation with two upcoming um, grace grades. With, with the Speaker of the Assembly, inquiries have been made, um, but a conversation has not yet been had. Um, it's something that we continually kind of put out there as a reminder uh, because that vacancy is starting to uh, get a little bit older. Um, it's not as much of a priority as the governor's um, vacancy after, you know, the vacate, after Dr. Alviso vacated that position um, because it's been, you know, if you look at the way that that's set up, we're, we're getting close to three years now that that particular position has been vacant. Um, historically speaking, though, if you go back and using that same chart, if you look at um, Katarina Ellaby's position, prior to her appointment, her position was vacant for a very long time as well. Um, I think part of it is just administrative administration based. It depends on how well the board performs um, and if a, an emergent um, situation is, is deemed. If they think that you guys are doing okay, it's almost like if it's not on fire, they're not gonna put it out. Um, but which is also why we wanted to create this graphic to kind of emphasize two vacancies is you know not something that I want to have to deal with. Four vacancies is a uh, you know an impossibility to deal with. So right. um, the only other thing I would point out about the graphic is, and we kind of touched on ADA compliance and converting documents. This document looks a lot better before it's converted, right? And so as you can kind of see up in the top left corner, our logo is turned into kind of an X. <laughs> And there are a couple other elements that I'm not going to point out. To <laughs> no, there's some elements here that are missing because of the conversion, but we'll continue to work on that as well. So this was converted to what? So we send our agenda materials to DCA's Office of Information Services, and they run it through an ADA um, check and try to create them as ADA acceptable as possible. But there is something that's happening in the translation and you'll, and you'll see throughout this document, um, I've been noticing it all day, and the outreach reports and the reg reports, anything that's graphic-based, text sometimes disappears, um, changes color, you know, I can't, I don't know why yet, but it's something that DCA and I are definitely going to have to work out. So just, just to clarify, when we look at that PTBC logo in the upper left-hand corner, that isn't doing a service to anyone. No. That's a blip. <laughs> Correct. And, and really, if you really look at it, there is kind of a diamond tuft pattern in the whole document. And if you think about PDFs and layers and mm -hmm. the way they're made, the logo has fallen behind the diamond tuft pattern. And so you're seeing through the line. Right. So, again, so it's a ghost in the shell at this point, and we're trying to figure it out. This is Daniel. Um, when we're looking at this on screen in WebEx, I, I see exactly what you're talking about. When I look at my own agenda book, uh, where I take where I write notes and, and document things, it's actually fine. Yeah. The document appears, the, so the logo appears just fine. Um, yeah. It, and so I think that there might be a translation thing with just getting it into WebEx. Well, what happens there is that, you know, talking about that legislative bill and when we send materials out and sending them to the public at the same time, Brooke sent these materials to the members directly. And so they were sent to you prior to the ADA um, conversion. Mm -hmm. WebEx is relying on the ADA conversion from our website. I understand. 
one other, just one other thing that I would suggest, um, because um, I believe Dr. Dominguez and uh, before him, Dr. Jewell, were in, are in a specially designated position for somebody who's in education. Uh, and so potentially just making a notation on it, with that member number um, that it does it that it's don't qualify and describe who that's supposed to be. Absolutely. Thank you for that. You're welcome. This is Jesus. Just um, just a, a, a silly comment. You know, if the two exclamation points and the triangles were enough, I'm thinking that logo is making this extremely urgent that we address <laughs> this. Um, and the other more serious question really is for Madam President. Did in your interview, was it discussed, uh, was the potential length of the, I don't know if it's a reappointment or if it's an extension into grace or whatever the, the appropriate terminology is. What, did you get a sense, Alicia, of how long that, um, you know, redefinition of your position might be? I was under the impression it would be for another full term since I came in the middle of a term. Got it. Um, and I did discuss my concerns. Well, one of the questions was about, did I have any concerns? And the first concern I had was quorum. That's what I brought up, was that we've got two vacant positions and two of us ready to head out. And so I am very concerned about quorum because we need four and we've got five. So we're not too far from, from missing that if something were to happen. Um, so I did make that clear. Uh, Katerina, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I did also, uh, this is Katerina. I did also have an interview with the governor's office and I was also under the impression that it would be for another full term. Um, they were not specific as far as timeline is concerned. It was more so like, you'll hear from our people type of vibe. Um, but uh, I guess no news is good news. So I'm gonna take that glass half full approach again and just assume that their office is busy taking care of other things. Uh, I did sort of highlight while I was being interviewed though that institutional knowledge being passed down takes time <laughs> and we only meet quarterly so like sooner rather than later would be nice um this is jason i've I, i've made an argument in the past and have been successful in um asking for the governor's office to consider whether or not a board member has served a full term in their first term and if they haven't um, to consider, at least consider that in trying to establish whether or not they're qualified to serve for what would be either considered a third term or a second, being that the first was not complete. And we have that situation both with um, Alicia and Katerina. They did not serve a, a complete first term. Um, and I also think that in a kind of a weird way that COVID-19 has some bearing on this also. Um, changing of the guard under normal circumstances, you know, it has its challenges. But changing of the guard under COVID-19 circumstances could be even more challenging. And so I agree with Katerina that institutional knowledge and its transference can be, um, can be difficult. And so I'm hoping that the governor's office is um, sympathetic to our needs and maybe we'll receive notifications of reappointment very soon. Has there ever been somebody who's, who initiated the term when at the start of the term? Who, and it, who, right. Uh, because of what you just said, I, had, yeah. I guess I had assumed that um, Dr. Ravina Mann and Ms. Ellaby had started on, on time, on term, but now that's not the truth. And I know that Dr. Dominguez and I both started after, did not start at the beginning of when the term was actually there. Um, I don't know for certain um, in, the, in the past that it hasn't actually happened. I'm hoping that it has, but in my experience, 
it's very unlikely that an appointment actually happens at the beginning of a term. It's, it's kind of why we have the grace period built in. Um, and most members do choose to serve their grace. Um, it allows time for the appointing power to find their replacement. And so it does create this kind of, you know, fragmented process, which is why we wanted to create this visual, because um, I think there's a misnomer that, you know, as an example, if you are appointed in October, um, that somehow your next reappointment will happen four years from that date. Mm -hmm. And it really doesn't have much to do with that at all. The actual terms themselves are static and cyclical, um, and people come and go into them in all different time durations. This would be, a, this is Katarina, this would be a great graphic to show during the board member orientation, because I'm pretty sure most people do, are not aware of the static terms. That's an excellent point. Yeah, this is Tanya, I agree. So we've um, heard from board members regarding agenda item number 13, budget report, outreach report, and board member appointment. And I would like to open it up for discussion from the public, please. Um, moderator, will you please open the lines as appropriate? All right, this is the moderator and at the direction of the board, I will open up the Q&A feature now. Members of the public, if you would like to make a public comment, please click on the icon of a question mark up in a square located at the bottom center of your WebEx screen. We're currently sharing instructions on the screen for your reference right now. I will pause for a moment to allow the public uh, time to access the Q&A feature. This is a moderator. It looks like at this moment, there are no requests for public comment. Would you like me to close the Q&A feature? Yes, please, thank you. All right, the Q&A feature is now closed. Um, so moving on to the next agenda item, um, the application services program report. Um, I think the, the biggest thing you can take away from this briefing paper is that up to date, um, everything is pretty much business as usual but we would like to highlight we're moving into what we would consider our busy season um, with schools graduating and uh, MPT being offered two times in the month of July. Compacted by um, recent furloughs and contact tracing, as I've kind of mentioned in my executive officer report, we can't expect um, the existing delays to maybe be exacerbated, exacerbated by those things, but we will do, and I know staff will do um, everything they can to mitigate that, um, but it is something that we do definitely need to bring to the board's attention that given the circumstances, um, it would be unreasonable to think that we would not suffer in some way. So um, other than that, you know, provided to you are the normal reports about applications um, received licenses issued and also the score reports for both the national exam and the California law exam. This is Dr. Rabina Amen. Can you tell me what um, on the on the first graph there or table uh, chart on page one one four at the top? What is OOS? Out of state, so Out endorsement of applications. State. Ah. This is Daniel. Um, Jason, anecdotally, do we anticipate any major changes with quarter four? I know that it's not reported at this point because we're in it, but. Yeah, no, I, 
as we kind of report in the, uh, the last uh, the last paragraph of the quarter three statistics that we did see a, a, a significant decrease in the PTA programs because of their difficulties completing programs. I would expect in quarter four to also see that for PT programs um, as a result of not having a you know, suitable amount of clinical placements um, and having to extend their graduation dates. But I do think that that's something that we could um, look forward to. I think it's a, a to be expected. Any other board comments? Okay. Um, we can move on to uh, agenda item 15, which is the. Uh, Should I ask for public? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, please. Should I? After each item? Yeah. Okay. Um, so we'd still like to invite the public to comment um, on agenda item 14. If there's any, some moderator, if you could please open the line. Sure. And at the direction of the board, I've opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Uh, members of the public, if you would like to make public comment, please click on the icon with a question mark with, uh, with a question mark within a square located at the bottom center of your WebEx screen. Um, we're currently sharing instructions for your reference. And I'll pause just a second to allow the public access to time to access that. All right, this is a moderate. Oh, uh, well, I have a raised hand from um, Executive Officer Jason Kaiser. It was just a test to see if it's working. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> Um, it looks like at this moment, there are no requests for public comment. Would you like me to close the Q&A feature? Yes, thanks so much. You're welcome. I'm extremely impressed how quickly you caught it, though. <laughs> um, so on to agenda item 15, um, the license maintenance services report. Um, again, I, I think um, business as usual, but um, online requests um, have increased. People are moving more to that, which I think is extremely um, good. Um, and as long as people are able to, you know, facilitate those transactions through Breeze from the comfort of their own home, I think the virus has very little impact uh, on the delivery of that service. So I would encourage licensees who need to do name changes or address changes to utilize the Breeze process and to do so, um, to try and submit those changes through paper is going to be delayed both through the U.S. mail, but also through our ability to process that mail because of staffing. So I couldn't encourage um, the use of Breeze strongly enough. Um, and you have before you some of the normal statistics that you're used to seeing. And if you have any questions about them, I'd be happy to try and answer that. Not hearing any comments from the board members. Um, I'm wondering if you might be able, I don't see it reported on here, but I think that there might be a new way for applicants to view their PTLA status. Um, going, okay, going back to the applications report, um, that we have some added functionality in Breeze for applicants to be able to see new milestones in their Breeze account to kind of say where they are in the application process. And so they will receive a delivery through Breeze once PTLA status has been granted. Um, so we're hoping to, that that provides a little bit more of an informational account for them to know where they are. Hopefully that lessens their ability to call in um, or spend you know time writing an email and sending correspondence to us or something like that. We want Breeze to be a self-serving portal as much as we possibly can. Um, and we also have other proposed changes in effect to kind of keep that improvement process rolling. But we're, we're really excited about that one. And so far, um, it looks like it's working really well. 
Does that save our staff? Um, oh, yeah, yeah. I, I, it has the potential for saying it, saving a significant amount of time. Um, of course, we still have, you know, some applications for whatever reason that are still, you know, providing their applications on paper, um, sometimes whole graduating classes. And for a number of different reasons, sometimes a particular school program, um, excuse me, a, a school program handles the payment of the application process as part of the um, cost of that program. And it makes it difficult for them to do that. So they submit all the paper applications at one time and mail us a single check. We've tried to reach out to those programs and kind of explain to them or coach them through the process. They can still have their applicants apply online individually, mail us that check with a list of who it pertains to, and you know our staff will try to match those up. Anytime that we receive applicants on applications in paper, there's going to be a delay compared to the breeze process. And even from that, anytime we receive a paper check, there's going to be a delay from the breeze process. Um, it has to go through our central cashiering unit here at the Department of Consumer Affairs. It takes a, a few days to reconcile and be applied to the transaction here at the board, where if you apply on um, online through breeze and you pay online through breeze, it's instantaneous, right? So if an applicant is really looking for that expedited service, breeze is the way to go. Thank you. And kudos to staff for continuing to develop new ways to uh, help the, uh, the applicant make it easier and also make it easier on themselves. That's awesome. PTB staff really operate under that kind of, if it ain't broke, break it. <laughs> In a good way. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> okay, any other um, board comments? This is Jesus. Yes. Just you know, props again to, I had no idea that Breeze had that sort of, you know, status monitoring functionality, which is great. We're, I know personally I get, um, you know, comments from student uh, affairs officers saying the roadmap was was a great thing to have on, on the website. So now that uh, applicants can actually, you know, check on the status of where their application is in the system, that, that's great. And the other thing, just for Jason, if it ain't broke, uh, I forgot what you said. If it ain't broke, break, break it? it. No, no. If it ain't broke, make it better. Yeah. But you <laughs> gotta break it. Fix it. <laughs> That's true. Um, I'm glad that you received the feedback on that. I'd ask, you know, the educators on the on the board to kind of keep an eye out for any other kind of feedback. We'd be, you know, happy to hear about that. Um, Something you know was brought to my attention. Some of the things that I was just saying. When we do receive paper applications, um, those those applicants can still link that paper application to Breeze and benefit from those milestones reported in progress. So even somebody who's applied on paper, I would still encourage them to create their Breeze account, link their application to their Breeze account, so that they can receive those milestones as well. I think it was a prior meeting, maybe the last one we had in person, um, where we also talked about that roadmap because it was so helpful to see that visual for applicants um, on each step of the way that there might be something in the works for foreign educated PTs as well. Any news on that? that so that's still being worked on. Um, and then kind of as, not as a result of that conversation, but at least contributed from that conversation a roadmap to also separate endorsements. As Fantastic. Well. Yeah, thank you. That's great. Um, and then, you know, along the same lines of asking the educators, you know, to provide us any kind of feedback anytime they hear it, um, also encourage your students to take our online survey for satisfaction. You know, we, you know, there are students out there that may have a fabulous idea that none of us have thought of yet. Mm -hmm. And if it is, you know, we have no shame, we'll take credit for it and employ it. But we really want to know from them if we're doing a good job or not. Where do they take that survey? Once they're licensed, they'll receive it electronically in mail. Okay. Awesome. Any further board comment? And moderator, if we could please open up for public discussion. 
All right, this is the moderator speaking. Um, at the direction of the board, I have opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a public comment, please click on the icon with a question mark within a square located at the bottom center of your WebEx screen. Currently sharing instructions for your reference. I'll pause a moment to allow you at time to access that Q&A feature. This is a moderator. It looks like there are no requests for public comment. Would you like me to close the feature now? Yes, please. Thank you. All right. The Q&A feature is now closed. Um, okay. So moving on to agenda item 16A, which is the continuing competency audits report. Um, you will see that a significant amount of progress has been made by the CC unit. Um, again, one of those units that's not exactly properly staffed at this point, but um, with the resources they have are doing a tremendous job. Um, also kind of, you know, contributing to other forms of the unit too. With shortages, um, continuing competency has been um, redirected in the past to help us process applications timely. And moving forward with um, COVID-19 and our busy season, we can anticipate that that's probably going to happen again. Um, but having said that, I'm our continuing competency program, um, audits of those licensees um, and the collection of data for the recognized approval agencies and in the future audits of those recognized approval agencies and providers will still continue, but just not on the anticipated pace. We're going to have to concentrate on primary mandates in the future, um, looking at enforcement program and looking at the, you know, the, the issuance of licenses as our two main objectives. And so we may be shifting some resources from that CC unit with that in mind. Um, but as you can see, uh, I think it's also another one of those kind of business as usual reports. The, the pass rate of our audits tends to um, fluctuate very little. Um, with the exception of assistance, we've seen, seen some fluctuations, but I think you can write that, you can write that off the sample rate. Um, and then as you'll see, currently there's a 125 different recognized approval agencies and from what we can see through inventory almost a little over 14,000 different courses that are available to our licensees to take credit for um, and then again if you have any questions please board member comment Okay, and so I do see that we do see have some attendees um, watching, and we would like to invite the public uh, in to make a comment. And if you were here in person, we'd definitely like to invite you up to the microphone. So please, if you have something to share, go ahead and type it in and let the moderator know. Moderator, please open the line. All right, this is the moderator and at the direction of the board, I have opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Uh, members of the public, if you would like to make a public comment, please click on the icon with a question mark within a square located at the bottom center of your WebEx screen. There's instructions up on the slide deck right now. Um, and I'll pause a moment to allow you time to access the Q&A feature. Thank you. This is the moderator. It looks like there are no requests for public comment. Would you like me to close the Q&A feature now? Yes, please. Thank you. All right, the Q&A feature is now closed.
Okay, uh, moving right along to agenda item 17A, which is the Consumer Protection Services Programs Report. Um, while, you know, COVID-19 has certainly provided and demonstrated an impact on applications and licensing, um, enforcement is a completely different lens to look through. Um, and so we're able to kind of collect a little bit more um, data on the impact of COVID-19. So you can kind of see um, staff from CPS has put together kind of a list of pros and cons of what it's like to telework during COVID-19. Um, one of the most significant impacts really is uh, the ability to be able to work with other government agencies, um, the Division of Investigation, the Department of Justice, and just kind of the disconnect that happens trying to telework. Um, we've tried to mitigate that. DCA has been instrumental in providing um, online cloud services to allow my staff to work from home and still have access to our internal networks, um, which has been invaluable. And then recently, um, in conjunction with our move upstairs, we have switched from tower-style PCs to laptops and employed um, virtual private networks so that staff can have kind of a seamless transition, um, do the same work at home that they can do in their cubicle here in the office, with the exception of you know handling paper in their physical hands. Um, so again, I think uh, time will tell and we'll have uh, more experience to speak on at the September meeting, but this report definitely reflects what we've experienced up to this point. Um, this is Tanya. Um, Jason, I don't know if this even relates to this, but was there any consideration made towards like the work balance now that your staff is working from home? In, you, internally here? Work life balance. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, you just heard grandma in the background, so. Yeah, no, and, and that's the, you know, one of the things that I think even pre-COVID, we've always encouraged staff to, you know, maintain a family first kind of philosophy. Um, and in supporting each other, we're able to do that. So it's, it's, it translates into this particular time also, right? And so we wanna make their ability to work from home um, as seamless and as easy as possible. Um, and there's all, it's a dichotomy. There's always this balance. I have a mandate to achieve in consumer protection and the issuance of licenses, but the other side of that dichotomy is taking care of our staff. And so, you know, every once in a while, I have to sacrifice one for the other, but try to maintain a balance over time. And so during, right now during COVID-19, yeah, we are very cognizant of trying to maintain a work-life balance. Um, and I guess you can kind of see that from some of the reports that we've provided today, is that we want to prepare the members that you may see an expected dip in performance as a result of the virus. There are fewer of us, there are more obstacles in our way, and it's natural to think that we're not gonna be able to perform at the same rate we were prior to the virus. Thank you, because I know I'm finding it very difficult, <laughs> very difficult personally uh, with the interruptions from the tiny person that's with me 24 <laughs> seven. I, I can tell you from personal experience, teleworking from home a couple days a week is actually more exhausting than coming into the office. I mean, there is uh, there's something about- Amen. <laughs> yeah, there's something about having to be available at all times, but you know, with these situations, communication is the, the, the key factor. And so constantly communicating to get the work done um, is tiresome and not, not just for myself, but for all members of our yeah. staff, yeah. Um, you know, whether it's, you know, application staff dealing with applicants or license maintenance staff dealing with licensees, um, consumer protection staff dealing with investigators, respondents, um, attorneys from the attorney general's office, and even trying to kind of accommodate calendars with the Office of Administrative Hearings and 
um, those kind of things. It is a whole new world, right? So um, with the intent of just trying to perform well, we're always looking for new ways to do things um, and maintain that quality. Thank you, Jason. Absolutely. Yeah, good to hear. Other board comments? This is Jesus. Um, just a quick question for, for Jason. Um, Jason, I'm not sure. I know Christy prepared this, but under cons, I'm not sure I understand what number four is, uh, bullet point. Um, legal work can only be done in office. Is that just sort of like yeah, DOI? A good, Sorry. a good example of that would just be documents that require wet signature, right? So some of these things can be done through kind of a scan, sign, and email response. But some of these documents have to be collected from outside government agencies, reviewed, uh, and then actual wet signature applied. And so some of that legal work um, that cannot be done from home, and, and there are other reasons too, like sensitive information, personal identification information, criminal rap sheets, those are the kinds of things that they can't actually take from the office with them home. That necessitates them either having to work a couple more days a week or make pit stops, right? So they might come in, grab some work and go, um, come in, process some work and go. But the, that, the, legal, the legal side of those or those, or those legislative mandated sides of those things can make the work um, difficult to telework with. This is Jesus. Thanks, Jason. You sensitive private information. Thank you. This is Dr. Rubina Amen. In the paragraph for the update, uh, end of the third sentence, it says that um, to name a few processes that have been impacted, response times for obtaining information documents have been delayed. What sorts of information and documents are those? So at the same time that you know PTBC is teleworking from home, um, local jurisdictions, court, courts, county clerks, police departments are are strapped for personnel also. And so their ability to respond to our requests is limited and slower than usual. Mm -hmm. So if we're reaching out to a particular court asking for a particular document, we can expect a delay in receiving it. Mm -hmm. And even not just a delay in receiving it, but a delay in response of even acknowledging our request. Um, and depending where you are, um, some Southern California counties were, were very hard hit Sometimes those courts are just shut down. And so that's a, a delay that can't be um, worked through. Mm -hmm. We just have to wait until they open back up and then they have a backlog of work. So, you know, again, you know, working the analysis of a case is kind of like, uh, you know, babysitting, if you will. And they're babysitting these cases. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis, and sometimes progress just can't be made until those um, local jurisdictions come back online. So our performance measures will be real fun to look at. Yes, I, I would. I would uh, definitely caution that the, to the members to expect um, the performance measures to be affected by COVID-19. Any other board comments? I'll now open the discussion up for public comment. Moderator, please open the lines as appropriate. All right, this is the moderator. Um, and at the direction of the board, I have opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Members of the public, if you would like to make a public comment, please click on the icon with a question mark within the square located at the bottom center of your WebEx screen. We currently have instructions on the screen for your reference right now. I'll pause a moment to allow the public time to access that Q&A feature. This is the moderator. It looks like there are no requests for public comment. Would you like me to close the Q&A feature now? Yes, please, thank you. Okay. Q&A feature is now closed. Thank you. 
Okay, so now I will try to do my best impersonation of Monty Martin. Um, agenda item 18A, the probation monitoring program report. Um, you have your statistical report and an update. Um, one of the things that, again, I'll, you know, I'll bring to the board's attention is that COVID-19 has an impact on all of the units, including probation monitoring. Um, as you can imagine, for our participants in the program that have to do a drug rehabilitation through Maximus, um, closures can affect them as well. So, on a case-by-case -case basis, we've had to deal with um, respondents' inability to be able to find a site to do um, bodily fluid testing. And, you know, to no fault of their own, um, Monty has, you know, again, an increase in workload to kind of monitor those things, um, especially when, you know, a closure in that area affects one of his probationers. Um, as soon as that closure is ended, it's really up to Monty to kind of make sure that that probationer knows it and gets in and tests as quickly as possible. So, again, it's one of those things where the virus has actually impacted all aspects of board business. Um, it's a little bit easier with a probation agreement for us to be able to look at something on a case-by-case -case basis and provide discretion um, and not consider something that technically may be a violation is not really a violation because it's not in control of the actual probationer. So, um, but it definitely increases um, the work that Monty has to do on a day-by-day -day basis. Monty's a little bit you know, on the road, and so I think he's more adapt than the rest of us and staff to be able to telework. Um, but it's not to say that it hasn't been difficult for him as well. And if there's um, any other questions that you have about the, the monitoring program, um, I will try to answer those for you. Board member comments? And if we can open it up for public comment, please. All right, this is the moderator and at the direction of the board, I will be opening up the Q&A feature now. Uh, members of the public, if you would like to make public comment, please click on the icon with, an, with a question mark within a square located at the bottom center of your WebEx screen. Currently sharing instructions on your screen for reference right now. I'll pause a moment to allow them time to access that feature. All right, this is the moderator. It looks like there are no requests for public comment. Would you like me to close the Q&A feature now? Yes, please, thank you. All right, the Q&A feature is now closed. Thank you, Jason, for all of those reports. Appreciate it and appreciate all the hard work that staff is doing, um, especially under the circumstances of the last couple of months, last few months. Um, we're now on agenda item number 19, which is public comment on items not on the agenda. And sometimes this is our um, board members' favorite time, especially when we're in person and we see that we've got um, some participants. So some of you who are still on the line attending, um, this is our time to open up uh, for comment for you. And it can be on anything that's not on the agenda. Sometimes people just ask us general questions about being board members or, or something else. Um, we don't take action on them, but we do like to engage with the public. So I'll ask the moderator to please open up the lines and let's see if we can get any participation. All right, this is the moderator and at the direction of the board, I've opened up the Q&A feature for public comment. Uh, members of the public who are on the line, if you would like to make a public comment, um, please click on the icon um, with a question mark within a square located at the bottom center of your WebEx screen. There's instructions up on the slide right now. Um, and I'll pause to give you a little bit of time to ac access that and type, I would like to make a comment.
This is the moderator. It looks like there are no requests for public comment. Would you like me to close the Q&A feature now? Yes, yeah, thank you so much. Okay, okay so um, just want to acknowledge that this has been um, a different experience for us, right? Let's uh, take agenda item number 20 and any items that board members want to put out for future meetings. This is Katrina. Um, I would like to have a little bit more discussion about uh, the potential loss of revenue due to COVID-19 and how we can sort of strategize or prepare for that um, sooner rather than later, perhaps anticipate some challenges and uh, maybe save a little bit more or what we can do to just be mindful of that. Thank you, Katarina. Other ideas? This is Jesus, Madam President. I, um, the, over the last three months, I think I've gotten quite a few inquiries from licensees, as well as from um, DPT education programs and, and students about telehealth and what is permissible and what is not. And I was just wondering if I, I would suggest that we might want to discuss that topic maybe in a presentation or at least so that I feel uh, that I can be consistent with the messaging. Uh, I know I reached out to Jason on a few occasions um, to, to try and answer questions from licensees and, and students in terms of supervision during uh, clinical experiences. So I'd like to throw that in there for consideration. Thank you. So just to clarify for the purposes of planning in the future, Specific to licensees or specific to clinical placements for future applicants? This is Jesus. Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, you know, if it could be uh, realistically accomplished in in one presentation, that would be greater. If, if um, you or or our council think it might be uh, better served with two presentations, or whatever. I leave something that to your discretion. Something we haven't done in an extremely long time is have a representative from CAPTI um, come and present on anything, really, for this matter. But um, we could have someone, uh, I'll at least reach out to CAPTI to see if they're willing to um, talk about clinical placements and what the expectations are for academia and supervision of students. Um, Stacey Defoe kind of um, talked about a, a WebEx that we had done uh, about a month and a half ago with a number of program directors, and they had some of the same questions that I think you're asking. So um, some of what I had to answer in that presentation was, it depends on CAPTI. And so I'll, I'll reach out to CAPTI and see what I can arrange. This is Jesus. Thanks, Jason. I, I know you and, and Stacy probably communicated frequently i just thought you know i i just would appreciate being uh, uh in that loop so thank sure. you other ideas for future um agenda items Um, just one point of note, um, you'll see on the agenda item 20 that our next meeting is scheduled for September 18th and 19th at Carrington College in Pleasant Hill. And that was our plan A, but I would, you know, stress that that is now our plan B. Um, we will keep it as plan B, but kind of as we mentioned before, it does look like moving forward with um, where we are in California that we can expect WebEx and for the duration of the year uh, at this point. Um, if things change, um, that's why we have plan B. Um, but where it was plan A, it's now plan B. And so you'll see that change uh, once we know definitively that that situation. Okay, 
One last call for a future agenda item. And one last call for public comment on this particular item. Moderator, if you can open the lines, please. Sure, this is a moderator and at the direction of the board, it will be opening up the Q&A feature now. Uh, members of the public, if you would like to make public comment, um, please click on the icon with a question mark within a square located at the bottom of your WebEx screen. Currently sharing instructions on the screen for your reference now. I will pause to allow the public to access that Q&A feature. This is the moderator. It looks like there are no uh, requests for public comment. Thank you. I want to thank um, those of you who have Madam been in President, attendance. Yes. I'm sorry. I didn't get my, um, I got my hand up, but I didn't get to the microphone fast enough. Uh, the agenda, um, the final item in the agenda, item 20, um, which was just addressed about our, our next meeting. Um, I believe our next meeting is not at, in Pleasant Hill. It's at the Guernica Academy in San Mateo. Correct. Oh, you're correct. Oh. Yeah, we were at Carrington College last September, right? Correct. Okay. Thank you. So again, thank you um, for those of you who have attended and thank you for um, moderating um, Solid, thank you so much. You've been very helpful. And I think we're going to go into closed session. And um, so we will not have any more public session as of today. And um, after closed session, we'll adjourn not going into public session. So um, the time is 3.48 and we're going to go into recess. Madam President? Yes.